Hello, everyone. It's good to be here. Thank you so much uh, for the privilege of uh, serving you through the Word of God. Last week, if you were here, or if even you watched the uh, sermon uh, online, you would have noticed that we preached uh, from the first part of Joshua chapter 3, verses 1 to, se uh, to 6. Today we're going to continue that chapter from 7 to 17, basically the second part of the chapter. And as I mentioned last time, this particular chapter, Joshua 3 and also the next one, Joshua 4, they are connected with each other and they are so powerful because it really shows us how faithful God is in fulfilling his promises that were given, believe it or not, 400 plus years ago. And now the Israelites are realizing that promise that God has made to their forefathers, starting with Abraham. The story of the crossing of the Jordan, which we are continuing to talk about today, that began last week, is a story that highlights the authorization of Joshua's leadership. Today, next week, we will begin to see why God is appointing Joshua to be the next leader of his people. The people have been used, of course, to having Moses, and he's been with them in the wilderness for 40 years. Moses just died, and as a result of this, a new leader has to step up and take charge. And God made it clear that it's going to be Joshua, but he has to also prove him before the people. In addition to Joshua, has to also prove himself to the Lord in terms of his faithfulness to God and God's guidance and God's promises. But as we know from the history of Exodus and especially in the book of Numbers, we're dealing with very difficult people who complained and whined all the time. And Joshua and Caleb were the only two who survived that generation. So Joshua knows very well, don't mess with God, because he means business. And the hope is that this second generation have gotten the message, and now things will become easier. And we will see right now in terms of numbers of years, that things got in a little bit easier, at least at the moment. Our passage basically serves as a witness to the God who calls us into places of wilderness, by the way. Life is going to be a journey through wilderness, and we need to be ready and prepared to cross Jordan rivers all the time, but we cannot do it on our own. We have to trust in God, and we have to also trust in His promises, and we have to realize that our battles are always do, be, going to be spiritual, more so than physical. The context for this particular event right now that we will be dealing with, which is the crossing of the Jordan River, really goes all the way back 400 plus years to Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3, when God called Abraham at that time, before he changed his name to Abraham, and told him, get out of your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land that I will show you. And this is the land. The Israelites, pretty soon, they can see that land across the Jordan River. And God made that promise to Abraham and was so faithful to him. And he says that you will be blessing to all nations and I will bless you and I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you and I will make your name great. You are going to see a similar motif here, a similar imagery between Joshua and Abraham. Because God again will tell Joshua that I'm going to make you great as well. So we have the mega picture in the story of Abraham. Fast forward. We get to the story of the Exodus. 
The span between the two is 400 years. God already told Abraham in Genesis 15 that your descendants that are countless, you won't be evil, able to even do a census to figure out how many of them are. After I resurrected you back from the dead, technically speaking, from a genealogical standpoint, you will have genealogical, uh, I should say, descendants. You, your name is going to be great. It's going to take 400 years for your descendants to be slaves in a foreign land. Let me put it another way. They will be forgotten. Nobody will care. Nobody will even remember them anymore. But I will. We get to the Exodus. And God reminds Moses of who he was and asks him to go to deliver his firstborn son, Israel, into the place that he has promised their forefathers so that they may worship him. Why? Because they've been influenced by the foreign gods around them. It's time for them to know that this God is the God of all the earth. But sadly, because of the unfaithfulness of the people and because of the sins of the people, they spend 40 years in the wilderness. And after all of this, all of them perish except for two. Why? Because they were unfaithful to a faithful God. Folks, Sometimes we wonder, if God called me to do something, a business, a ministry, an idea, to move from one place to the other, why is it taking so long for me to realize what I was hoping to accomplish? And I would say we ought to ask ourselves first, what am I doing wrong? It has nothing to do with God. What am I doing to allow me to, uh, to prevent me from realizing what God made it clear to me that this is His will for me, that this is what He wants me to accomplish, that this is the place where He is leading me to. Oftentimes, there are things that are preventing us from realizing that joy, from capturing the heart of God who sent us there Many times this is fear. Fear that leads into rebellion, actually, against God. Fear that leads us into doing things our way rather than doing it God's way. And you will see in the story here today that if it wasn't for the faithfulness of Joshua and the priest stepping into water first, that they would have never realized the promised land. Hebrews 3, 12 tells us, warns us actually, beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. And it's an interesting really phrase here because Joshua uses this phrase to describe who God is. He is the living God. He's not just a God carved out of stone. He's not a God that was made by human hand. He's the living God, the source of all life, and He is the one that will be in the midst of His people, and He is in the midst of your life if you know Him. But sometimes we hinder our final journey or the purposes of where we're at because of our unbelief not because of our belief. So we have to start with ourselves and ask, why? What are we doing wrong? Is there a sin in our life? Is there something happening that is preventing us from continuing this journey at the pace that I was hoping for? This journey that they took in the wilderness would have been probably a week or two before they made it to the promised land. Let's say even a month but it took 40 years because of their sin. And also, we are going to see after they crossed the Jordan and after they 
have their first victory in Jericho, they get to Ai and they are blown with basically a severe defeat. Why? Sin of one man. One man. Achan. You see, as God's people, we have to hold each other accountable and we have to work as a community and we have to present ourselves as the bride of Christ, as the church, the body of Christ. We cannot just say, well, you know, so and so, you know, is free to do whatever they want to do. You see, sadly, we're turning into this kind of mentality. It's good for them, but it's not good for me. Whatever they want to do, it's up to them. It doesn't work that way. That's not what the Bible teaches. This is not what God wants us to do. He wants all of us to work together as a community of believers, as a body. Imagine your hands say, oh, good for you. You can go, but I'm not going with you. Or you're driving and your hand decide that I'm going to go left. You want to go right? I don't care about that. I'm just going to go left. It doesn't work that way. There is a reason why the scripture calls us the body of Christ. An indication of unity and working together. Finally, the Israelites are beginning to get the message, I hope, after 40 years of being in the wilderness. Now... We get to the story. And there was instructions that were given to Joshua for the people to cross. In verses 7 and 8, I'm just going to read a portion. It says, And the Lord said to Joshua, This day I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel. And it's really an interesting thing. First, it's indicating that it is the moment now when something is going to happen in the life of Joshua. This day, what I have already promised you, what I have also promised Moses, is going to be fulfilled. But it's not going to be a one moment in history. I'm not going to exalt you today and that's it. It's going to be a process. How do we know? Because this day I will begin. There is a start of this leadership process. The Lord, when he calls you, he begins his work on you. He who began work basically on us will complete it. This is a life journey. This is sanctification. This is what it's like to walk with God. There'll be a lot of valleys there is going to be a lot of wilderness. There is going to be a lot of these Jordan rivers. But if we are working with God, he will continue all the time to exalt you and to glorify you if you're working according to his purposes. This day, I will begin to exalt you. In the sight of who? All Israel. There is a purpose why God wants to do this. He wants to show the people that he brought out of Egypt. Yes, this is the second generation, but they still remember things. He wants to show them that just as he was with Moses, he's a faithful God. He will continue to be with Joshua. And guess what? He will be with the future prophets and the future kings as well. He's the same God who also was with David. He's the same God who was with Solomon. He's the same God who rescued his people after exile and brought him back to the promised land. He's the same God who fulfilled his promises in bringing Christ at the fullness of time to rescue all of humanity. He's not a God, by the way, who will say, okay, check, I'm done, see you later. No, we think this way, but that's not how God operates. Why am I going to begin to exalt you today? That they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. It is a continuation when it comes to my faithfulness. The hope is that they will be as faithful to the same God. Folks, you and I worship the same God 
who dealt with Adam in the garden. The same God who met with Abraham. The same God who is speaking right now to Joshua. He is the same God. Isn't that amazing? And tomorrow, he will be the same God speaking to our next generation and their generation. And the list will continue until Christ comes back. And guess what? He will be the same God that we will spend eternity with. That is an amazing thing indeed. No wonder he is being called the living God. The living God. Why? Because we cannot get our life without him. We don't live forever except because of his gracious act that he has done for us. Only then that we can spend eternity with him and still most will have to taste death. That was the price of sin. Some may not. At least that's what the scripture says. But we don't have to worry about these things. What we have to worry about is we're dealing with a faithful God, the living God, who will never ever leave us or forsake us. And most importantly, he doesn't forget about his promises. We may forget, but he never forgets about his promises. So in this chapter, basically, we begin to see the fulfillment of what God has promised Joshua already earlier in the same book in chapter 1. Many times he told him to be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous, Joshua. Don't worry. I will be with you. I am the same God that was with Moses. I'm sure. I'm sure Joshua, just like Abraham, was wondering and asking, well, how is that going to happen? God told Abraham, you know, you're going to have descendants. He's like, really? I mean, are you talking about my servant? And the Lord is like, which part of yours wasn't clear? I will resurrect you back from the dead. And now God resurrected his people back from technically the dead when they were in slavery for 400 years. And now he will continue to resurrect him also back from the dead after spending 40 years in the wilderness. He's a God of resurrection that they, so that they, we may know him, the scripture says, and the power of his resurrection. This resurrection power only God has. He can bring you back to life. Not necessarily that you were dead in the ground, but he will bring you back into the scene based on your faithfulness to him. But he's a living God. He's the God of all the earth. The reason why God wanted to exalt Joshua also, first, because he says, you will lead this people to inherit the land. That's in the first chapter, verse 6. And the second one in verse 9, also the first chapter, it says, the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Translation, I'm going to be with you with the future generation and the future generation. I'm not going to abandon you. You can trust in me. And now God in chapter 3 beginning to prove to Joshua that my words are true. What I told you is about to be fulfilled before your eyes. The purpose of Joshua's exaltation is to demonstrate also to the people with him that Yahweh is continuing to provide excellent leadership to them. You see, oftentimes we think just because the book is called the book of Joshua, somehow Joshua is the center of that book. Believe it or not, he's not. It is Yahweh who is at the center of that book. God is the head of that army. God is the king of Israel. And we know this because when we get to 1 Samuel and the people begin to whine and complain as always, Ask him for a king. God was like, oh, so they don't want me as a king anymore? Because, obviously, they wanted to copy the nations. We do this all the time. I hear it at churches all the time. I go to churches, believe me, and I hear things sometimes I want to just close my ears. In our church, this is how we do it. But I don't know about these guys. And sometimes, I, who are these guys? Aren't they part of the body of Christ? Are we talking about buildings now? Is that how things work? 
But that's how we are. We want what the others have. Bigger parking, better music instruments, loud voice when they're singing, jumping up and down. Why? Is that what it is? Worshiping the Lord, following the Lord, obeying the Lord is not measured by things like this. It's measured by our faithfulness to Him. God can use a small church to be more powerful in His kingdom than a mega one that is focused only on things that are meaningless. And that's the story in here. The people of God are always going to be complaining, always be going to be whining. How do we know this? Read the scripture. Right after they have the promised land, just read the book of Judges. It's an embarrassment to the history of the people of God. And then we get again to a king. And then after that, another king and another series of embarrassments. And then we get to the exile. And then after that, we get to Christ and another series of embarrassments. That's just our history. We have to trust in the Lord. He will deliver you all the time as long as you're faithful, as long as you keep your eyes on him. I'm going to keep going here because I don't want to spend forever, although I like the night ones because we can have dinner together, but that's okay. Also in the first chapter, it talks about when Joshua basically, it says, this is uh, what uh, uh, the verse uh, states, that verse 1, the, uh, chapter 3, I should say, verse 1 says, Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and they set out from Shedem. That's the name of a place. Some of the commentators believe that that's what became Jerusalem later. But there was some history in there. The people in Numbers 25 were unfaithful to God in that location. They actually worshipped foreign gods in there, Baal. And now, I love our God, by the way. He brings him back to the same place of that disaster and says, second chance. Now you will worship me. You see how God is, is a God of second chances, a God of grace. It was a disaster if you read Numbers 25. But now the Lord is saying, I'm going to give you a chance. We'll start a new chapter from the same location. It's no wonder that the last chapter of this book ends with amazing, amazing statements by Joshua. Starting from verse 13, this is what Joshua says. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river. And in Egypt, notice beyond the river, meaning before we crossed, he says, we were unfaithful to him. In the wilderness, we were unfaithful to him. When we were wandering and looking for how we can get to the promised land, we were unfaithful to him. We copied foreign nations. We wanted to worship foreign gods. So he's reminded him of this. And he says, and serve the Lord. Verse 15, and if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord... Choose this day whom you will serve then. Have it your way, if that's what you think. And then he closed by saying, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It's a beautiful verse. You see it sometimes. You walk into homes and you see it on the walls. This is what it's all about. It's about serving Yahweh, serving the living God, the God of all the earth. And you know, there are many gods in our lives. Now, I'm not picking on anybody, but sometimes there are many gods that somehow we could gravitate towards them. It could be money. It could be material things in general. It could be relationships. It could be a job. We do allow other gods to take over our life, knowingly or unknowingly sometimes. But we ought to recalibrate and come back to this reality. As for me and my household, 
we will serve the Lord. That's the summary of the entire book of Joshua. It's being faithful, sincere to this God who have rescued his people over and over and over again. In verses 9 to 13, after God has encouraged Joshua by reiterating his promise and showing him how he is going to exalt his name and make his name great, just like he promised Abraham before, now Joshua is encouraging the people. And Joshua says, So Joshua said to the children of Israel, Come here and hear the words of the Lord your God. It's really an interesting thing. Joshua assembles the Israelites and tells them that the words he is speaking right now are not his. They are the words of God himself. In Romans 10, 17, it says, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. Some translations will say by the word of God, one and the same. See, hearing the word of God is important. Because... When the Israelites hear the word of God, not only they hear things, but soon other senses are going to be used. They hear, and then in a little bit, they're going to see an amazing miracle that is going to happen right before their eyes. And on top of this, they are going to feel when they walk on a dry land that it's not wet. Have you ever seen the seashores basically being exposed you know when the water just the tide uh, basically goes a little bit further back and you walk on it I used to do that all the time back where I grew up but I'll go and just looking like for um, you know some of uh, the fish that is dead or uh, maybe uh, um, we don't have uh, basically lobsters but we have other creatures that I'll go running after them but it was wet it was muddy you'll sink in it sometimes but when we read here, it says that they were walking on dry land. And the dry land was emphasized more than once. Why? Because it's a reminder to them that just as their fathers walked on dry land when they crossed the Red Sea, they're doing the exact same thing. It's dry. I love some of the commentaries, by the way. You read it and say, oh, well, we think God did it by creating an earthquake or a mudslide. Well, you think God can't do it just without an earthquake or a mudslide? I mean, people always have to wrestle with these miracles. Like, how did it happen? How can the, red, the, uh, the, the Nile uh, River become red, you know? I'm sure there is a, a phenomenal that took place. No, just God made it red. That's it. That's what it says in the scripture. I don't have to worry my brain over how and what. It is what it is, you know? But we like to always doubt, think, challenge, logic, and we waste our energy on these things rather than just by faith. That's what God did. He stopped the river. The people can see a wall of water from afar. It's dry land, and they walked on it. So easy. That's it. Mission accomplished. But, of course, you have to spend pages trying to explain how this mission took place, rather than to focus on the meaning of why it happened in the first place. So, God basically told Joshua in verse 10, Joshua said, Hereby you shall know that the living God is among you, and that he will, without fail, drive, and then he mentions seven different nations or groups of people, that the Lord is going to drive out of the land that they're about to possess. You see, it's important for them to know that God is with them when they see what he has done to the river. Now they know this is the work of God. God is still with us. The same God that allowed us to cross the Red Sea and make it all the way over here, he's the same one who's with us. So we shouldn't worry then when he says that you will possess the land, then we will possess the land you think the people did what God told them to do of course not we cannot be the people of God if we don't complain and we ignore things and don't obey that's our nature that's how we know how to do things 
We love misery. We like to suffer. We like to text people and say, pray for me. Of course, the rest of the story, I'm not going to tell you why to pray for me because I got myself in trouble, but I just want you to pray for me. Oftentimes, if we really ask ourselves, why am I in this debacle, this situation, the chances are we may know that we got ourselves into it. That doesn't mean God is going to leave me or abandon me. Maybe it's a, a lesson now I'm going to have to learn, but sometimes we learn it the hard way. All that to say is that there is an emphasis now on the ark. Behold, it says, again, I'm reading from 9 to 13. Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth is crossing over before you into the Jordan. Now the people know that it is God who is leading the procession. And obviously, the use of the ark of God here is indicative, as I mentioned last week, of a spiritual battle more so than anything else, because it's the priests who were carrying it, not the soldiers. It wasn't an army corps of engineers getting in and trying to fix the river for them. It was the priests. And by the way, it wasn't just those specialized to carry the ark. It was just all of the priests were invited to do this. You know why this is an indication? Because we are called a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. And that was reiterated again in the New Testament. We are all called to serve God and to intercede on behalf of the other nations. And when they were crossing, by the way, it says that they crossed before Jericho. You think the enemies are not looking at what's going on? I mean, before this happened, they were already terrified of the God of Israel. Imagine how they felt when they saw what happened. But it's really beautiful imagery. When you read Psalm 23, one of the things in there, it says that you prepare a table, a meal for me in the presence of my enemies. When they crossed over, they stayed there. They camped, they ate, and their enemies were watching. In fact, I like God's strategy, but I don't want to jump ahead of myself. God allowed, basically, when they get, a, get there, he asked Joshua to tell the people that were not circumcised to get circumcised. Where? In enemy territory. They were incapacitated for three days. Now, if you are really developing a military strategy, this is the last thing you want to do. Because you're inviting your enemy to come and take over. But God says, I'm going to just keep proving to these people, I'm guiding you, I'm leading you, I'm protecting you. If they didn't believe in the first miracle, hopefully they believe in the second one. Another proof that God is with them. Let's keep going. Verses 14 and 15. Now we begin to see the faith of the people, but most importantly, the faith of the priest and Joshua. It says in verse 14, So it was when the people set out from their camp to cross over the Jordan with the priests bearing the ark of the covenant before the people. And as those who bore the ark came to the Jordan, and the feet of the priest who bore the ark dipped in the edge of the water, for the Jordan overflows all its banks during the whole time of harvest. There is an emphasis in verse 15 that we're not talking about the river during normal times. It was during the harvest time when the rainwater and also the water that was coming from Mount Hermon, basically, from the snow that was melting, it is overflowing. And if you just take, go and take a look at the gushing waters of the Jordan River, just go to YouTube and watch. We're not talking just smooth running water. No. That's the kind of water that they saw. Yet the priest had the faith to touch that water. It wasn't dry yet. You see, folks, sometimes if you want to see what God can do for you, you have to get your feet wet. If He calls you to do something, you must be faithful. And by faith, you have to walk through that valley or this river or whatever situation is given you. Because if it is God who's calling you, nothing is going to prevent him from using you. You see, God is waiting on you to give him whatever you could, and he will go with that. 
They just gave him a dip in water. And that's all that happened. They touched, the water stopped. That would be pretty cool, actually, if you could do something like this. That's what happened. The moment they dipped their feet in the water at the bank of the river, the water stopped. And all of a sudden, dry land. And then it says that they walked to the middle, and they stood there until the entire nation. By the way, this is the first time in this chapter they were called the nation of Israel. The nation. We don't know how long that took. Most likely it took probably half a day to a whole day. And they were standing there until everybody passed by and crossed to the other side of the river. What an amazing moment it was when you touched the promised land for the first time. And what an amazing moment it will be when we enter the land of rest in the presence of the living God. That's what's going on here. In Isaiah 30, verse 15, we read, For thus the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, has said, In repentance and rest you shall be saved. In quietness and trust is your strength. But then he continues and says, But you were not willing. And that's the problem. When you're not willing, problems happen. But when you are submissive to God, all things are possible. Now, when they crossed over to the other side of the river, you can look at this from a geographical standpoint. They're now into the promised land, geographically speaking, but from a theological standpoint, they ought to remember now that God is the one who got them there. It's no wonder then the next chapter you begin to read about the 12 men that God asked Joshua to call so that they will collect 12 pieces of stone and they will build a memorial. In fact, if you go to 1 Samuel, and I believe 1 Samuel chapter 6, verse 33, if my memory serves me right, in there you will see that it was the practice of the nations to put stones wherever they claim a land. I tried that with my neighbor. It didn't work. <laughs> but God says, put stones. Yes, God uses sometimes practices of the nations so that the nations will understand what's going on. That's one of the reasons why they did that. And of course, God wanted that to happen so that the people can tell their children about what God has done for them. And their children also will be at awe and they will remember it when they see the stones and tell their children also. You see, it's all about remembering what God has done for you. I love history. And I was like a little kid in a candy store when I went to Washington, D.C. for the first time. And my best experience was when I went to the Ford Theater and I saw where they laid Lincoln and I saw the pillow that has the blood. But another excellent experience was at Mount Vernon. The ladies of Mount Vernon when I went to George Washington's house. History teaches us something. We remember how things were in the past so that we can learn from them something that can help us in the future. Canceling history doesn't serve us well. It doesn't serve anyone well. Because you do not know what happened in the past, therefore you're not going to know how you can handle it in the future. There is a reason why God asked his people to have pillars of stone. And you will see that next time. We have to remember what God has done for us all the time. In conclusion, everybody's sighing a sigh of relief right now. Wow, we love this word. In conclusion of this event, basically, we have an additional insight into the significance of the reason for what God has done for this people, his people, 
and the purpose of the memorial that we will read about next time. But I'm going to give you a glimpse of the reason why God here mentioned through Joshua about 12 men. Later we'll know what was the purpose of having these 12 men representing the 12 tribes. To collect stones, to build a memorial. In the next chapter, chapter 4, verses 23 and 24, it says, The Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until you had crossed over. The Lord your God did to the Jordan what he had done to the Red Sea when he dried it up before us. Notice, Joshua was saying before us. He knows they were kids, they were little children. Some of them were born later. They didn't know what happened. But he says, these events happen to you to remind you of certain things and remind us also of what God has done in the past and he's doing it again before us until we have crossed over. He did this, look at the reason, so that all the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and so that you might always fear the Lord your God. First, there is a comparison between this event and the Red Sea crossing to show that God is faithful and God is still with you. Second, that all the people of the earth will know that God is powerful. You see how God thinks? God's heart is for all the nations, not just for us. When God blesses us, He expects us to be a blessing to others around us. And the ultimate blessing will be for them to know Him as the living God. We have to always keep that in mind. And the third reason is that the people have to fear God. What happened when people do not fear God anymore? What happened when you take the name of God out of things? Disasters come upon a nation. Folks, I really don't like to go there, but I have to say, our nation, if it continues in the direction that it is in, it's going down the tubes faster than we can ever imagine. And disaster is knocking on our door. And my prayer is that the believers will get down on their knee and pray for God's mercy upon this nation that was founded on biblical principles. It will be a miracle if things will continue the way they are Yet we are ignoring God, removing His name, and doing things our way. We're giving these stories to learn from it that we serve a faithful God. But I, this God doesn't tolerate sin, doesn't tolerate unbelief, and He will punish those that disobey even if they were His own people. So my prayer and my hope that we will be showered by His grace and mercies. So what do we learn application-wise from this story, from this particular chapter? How can this be applied to Christ? Jesus is the fulfillment, by the way, of this Ark of the Covenant of the Living God that the Israelite carried. He is the fulfillment of that. He is Emmanuel God is with us. Today, each one of us is like that temple. You have the living God in you. So you need to trust that God is with you all the time. Jesus has cleared the way for us to victory over all things. He disarmed principalities, powers, made public spectacle of them, triumphing basically over them in the cross. That's what Colossians 2.15 teaches. That's what Romans chapter 8, verses 31 to the end of that chapter teaches. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ. It also means that we keep our eyes on Christ, just like the people kept their eyes on that uh, Ark of the Covenant that led them all the way to the other side. Keep your eyes on the Lord and He will lead you to the other side. He will use you powerfully and He will fulfill 
His promises through you. It's an amazing God, folks. I mean, He could have done all of this Himself, yet He is so patient. He waited upon the, uh, the, the people, and He still used the same people that grieved Him for 40 years. I tell you, if I was God, they'll be, ding, gone, next. But I'm thankful that I am, I am not the God of this universe because our God is gracious. Because He is a God who desires for all men to be saved. His patience is salvation, the scripture says. And indeed, look at how many were saved. Some estimated, like I said, a million. Some estimate three million people have passed through. What an amazing God who waited patiently. Today, we don't, maybe we don't have the same experience of crossing an, a physical river, but we are given this story to learn from it, that victory can be achieved, provided you walk with God and you trust in His promises. God didn't hold back, by the way, the water for Israel before they put their feet in there. So we have to step out in faith and do the things that God is calling us to do. For believers today, crossing the Jordan represents, by the way, passing from one level of Christianity in your life to another. Sanctification. It's growth. You have to learn how to grow, mature, become stronger and stronger and stronger. But we have to go through sometimes tough times to learn that. God knows that. But the beauty about the God that we serve, He doesn't hold grudges against us. But He's patient also. Sometimes He wants you to stumble so that you can learn next time not to repeat the same thing again. That's the God that we worship. I'm going to close, if I may have just one more minute, with this story. During the Civil War, and, and this was mentioned in one of the commentaries uh, by Walter, uh, about Joshua 3. It says, During the Civil War, the town of Morsfield in West Virginia was on the dividing line and seesawed back and forth between the Federal and the Confederate troops. And in one old house, which apparently still stands today, an elderly woman lived alone. And one morning, Yankee troops stomped up on her porch and Though at their mer mercy, basically, she remained calm and invited them over for breakfast. And when breakfast was basically served before them, this is what she said to them. It is a custom of long standing in this house to have prayers before meals. I hope you won't mind, she said. And with that, she picked up a Bible and just opened it to Psalms 27. And she began to read, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. Then, verse 13, I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. She opened her eyes after she prayed, a brief prayer after this passage, and they were all gone. They got the message. She served a God who is powerful. Folks, maybe we are concerned Sometimes about things that are unfolding before our eyes. Maybe we are going through some trials. Maybe we're reflecting back on our lives and wondering where are we going. But one thing I can assure you of, we serve the living God 
the God of the whole earth. He's the God who led Abraham from his home to a land that he has showed him and led his descendants into the promised land. And out of him came Christ who led us from being dead into having eternal life. You think anything will be difficult for him? Not at all. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word, Lord. Thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for your guidance. Thank you for leadership. Father, we pray that stories from Joshua and other books from your word, Lord, will be a guiding light to us, Lord, so that we may know that you are the only true God, that you will be with us, that you will never leave us or forsake us, Lord. Father, we thank you for the trials that you allow us to go through. Help us, Lord, learn from them so that we may impart those experiences on our children that they may tell of you to their children and the next generation so that the people, your people, will fear you all the time. We ask all of this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.